We are so delighted to see all of you here tonight. It's going to be a great show. I've talked with Brian and you're in for a real treat. Hosting Brian is one of the many ways that the John Locke Foundation engages with the public, engages with thought leaders, and engages with the legislature as well. We are so happy to be a part of this community and to be a part of the public policy discussion in North Carolina. We engage with not only people on our side, but with the left, and we have debates. And indeed, we love it when people disagree with us. We really love it when people disagree with us because then we have the opportunity to discuss and tell people and show people how important it is for freedom to reign in North Carolina. Now, the mission of the John Locke Foundation, I call it human flourishing. What we want to see in North Carolina is to have everyone have the opportunity to flourish. And that means that government is basically out of your life and that you as individuals have the opportunity and of course the responsibility to flourish and to take opportunities and to take risks where it is necessary to do so. Now, as I mentioned, the John Locke Foundation engages particularly legislators, thought leaders, business leaders, community leaders in North Carolina. That's how we do it. We have a great team of researchers at the John Locke Foundation who think about freedom every day. That's what we do when we come into the office. We think, how can we make North Carolina more free than it is today? And so over the years, we're almost ready to celebrate our 30th anniversary, by the way, in a couple years. But over the years, our research team has developed and honed public policy ideas and public policy procedures that increase freedom in North Carolina. And what we do is take those ideas, take those policy papers, and through our outreach team, and many of you know Becky Gray, who is the head of our outreach team, Senior Vice President Becky Gray, she engages the legislature. She engages community leaders. She engages business leaders and makes sure that they understand what we're talking about, why freedom, and why the principles we're advancing are so very important to the future of North Carolina. And that's a lot of fun to do so. I know Becky, where are you, Becky? You're here somewhere. Stand up and raise your hand. There you go. You have, a, you have a following here, as you know. Now, I see many folks here tonight who are old friends and who support the John Locke Foundation, and I see many new faces here. Welcome. I hope you become a friend of the John Locke Foundation from now on. We are able to do what we do through the generosity of supporters throughout North Carolina. Those people who are very interested in freedom, those people who are interested in making their communities more free, their counties more free, their state more free, join with the John Locke Foundation. And through the John Locke Foundation, your desires to make North Carolina more free, your voices are amplified. And we take great pride and we take great care in how we do that in North Carolina. We want to make sure that your investment in the John Locke Foundation provides you with returns that you and your family and your future generations, your grandchildren and grandchildren to come, are going to be able to enjoy in North Carolina. So thank you to all of you who helped support us, and we hope that all of you who are new members tonight, new followers, will come in and support us as well. Now, the John Locke Foundation has, a, has had a long association with the Curtis Media Group. And Curtis Media, as you may know, runs many radio stations throughout North Carolina. But their premier radio station is WPTF Radio News 680. That's 680 on your AM dial. And it's a very special uh, uh, station for us because it's up to date. It always provides news. And in the afternoon drive period, our uh, Vice President for Communications, Donna Martinez, and her husband, Rick, have that spot. And they talk about 
relevant things and explain things very well. Don and Rick, are you here? Stand up, please, and let folks know. And if you don't get enough Donna in the afternoon, there's a Donna in the morning, too. Donna King hosts the morning show from 5. Is it to 9, Donna, in the morning? It's an early morning show. So Donna King, 5 to 9. Very good. So there's Donna King, and I hope you listen to her as well. And then immediately following Donna's show, as many of you know, is our guest tonight, Brian Kilmeade. Brian's show is on following Donna King's show. And I, have, I think many of you probably listen to Brian's show or you see him in the morning on Fox and Friends. And we are so delighted to have Brian here. As you know, Brian is a man who's full of energy. Brian is not only a radio host, a TV host, he's a, histori he's a history enthusiast, he writes about history, and indeed you have tonight with you and the books that he will sign later on if you haven't had a chance to have him sign it yet, his book on Andrew Jackson, who, by the way, is a North Carolina native. So we are extremely excited and pleased to have with us tonight Brian Kilmeade. Brian. Hey, Corey, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Hey, thanks so much for coming out, everybody. I appreciate it. You guys can hear me? All right. Special thanks to Corey Swanson for having me here. He has the decisive vote. When you're the CEO and president, he decides that's great. And for the board for approving it, truly appreciate it. Uh, Don Curtis, you mentioned Curtis Media. They were kind enough to give us a shot here in Raleigh on WPTF. I hope you're listening every day, 9 to noon. How many hands? You guys listening? Awesome. Thank you. So uh, we're on from 9 to noon, so he gave us a great chance. And I don't know if you heard Donna and Rick Martinez. They have managed to do the impossible, be on the air together, and have a successful relationship. <laughs> I know for certain that would not work with me. Um, and they were great. And of course, uh, uh, Donna King in the morning. And uh, I'll be contributing to that regularly. So as you know, I'm on Fox and Friends every day, 9 to noon, since, let me see, what's today, December? <laughs> Uh, I started filling in in December of, of 1996, and then got full-time in 1997, and through all the twists and changes of people not knowing what Fox was, not being able to get on your cable system, it's gradually, with every major event, it's gone, ratings kept going up and up and up, from when Princess Diana died, to the election mess in 2000, to the 9-11 attacks, to the Iraq war, the build-up, the aftermath, the other elections and the historic one where President Obama wins, uh, the collapse of the economy, we were there every step of the way. And the only thing consistent is that our ratings went up afterwards. And they did a study, and the reason why the ratings go up is because of me. <laughs> and every study I do, it comes out the same way. I asked my family, go out and ask people who are related to why they watch Fox. <laughs> And they come back with pie charts that reveal it's me, Brian Kilme. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's pretty obvious, number one, I got very lucky. Everyone has a point in their life when they get lucky and unlucky. I got really lucky. When I walked into Fox in 1996, I knew it had all the framework there. All they had was structure and potential. But, it, but I talked to the people. I saw the mission. I saw that they put on every negative headline they came out about Fox. CNN doesn't get ratings. Why would Fox get ratings? MSNBC's got a background. Fox got snow with 6 o'clock or 11 o'clock news. How do they expect to do well? Instead of Fox ducking and saying, uh-oh, they put up all the negative headlines around. I thought, this place is going to be a riot. Because they, they said, bring on the critics. We'll beat them all. And we did. And when I first got out there in New York, it wasn't even on in New York, Mayor Giuliani, who was close with uh, Roger Ailes, he said, uh, and he actually helped him get elected mayor, said, can you do me a favor and put us on New York? They don't want to put us on. So we put us on the public access channel so no one knew how to knit for a week. <laughs> and that didn't go over well, but it kept gaining steam. So I got hired to do news but sports. They said, Brian, do a three-hour sports show uh, during the, uh, on Sundays and do sports in the morning show. They changed the format, allowing me to do other stuff. But I was fascinated because I wanted to be a great athlete. Anybody else here play sports and wanted to be great? Okay. 
How many were great? Yeah. I wanted to be great, and I just said to myself, I'm going to pour myself into soccer. And I came out remarkably average. I trained over the summer, did the sacrificing, worked really hard, and in the end, I was an average Division II soccer player who, uh, when I first got there, I was starting, the new coach comes in, and the only thing he knew for sure is, I wouldn't be. <laughs> so, when I walked off the soccer field, I took my cleats off, and I said, I walked through the mud, and I said, what a waste of time that was. I go, I'm not even going to tell my friends what I did. Two end up uh, being All-Americans. One ended up scoring the winning goal in the longest overtime game in the history of the NCAA soccer. Another one ended up being runner-up Big East player of the decade. This guy named Patrick Ewing beat him out. What do you think I'm bringing up in the sports bar? My average Division II career when I finished off at Pace University, which no one can even find, let alone watch play? Don't think so. But what it did for me is when you give everything you can and you want to be great, and you don't, and I couldn't have told me this at 22 or even 32, what I learned is, so what? It was embarrassing to have your parents there and not start, to play against the friends you competed with, think you were better, but they didn't think I was better, and the coach would sit me. And what is that like? It sucks, but guess what? I survived. And you know what I did in retrospect? I blew my perfect game. And when you blow your perfect game, since I already failed, I said, nothing's stopping me from the next chapter of my life, and it was going to be on television and radio. So when I went out there, I was determined to be successful. I was on the dean's list every semester I was in college. I did every internship possible. And when I got out of college, I went right to Bennigan's, where I was able to wait tables successfully <laughs> for the next three years. And I really took the waiting world by surprise. It's amazing how many nachos I can deliver and how I could say quesadilla, but I couldn't spell it. And I just did everything on the side. I did these local shows. I did the broadcast. I, I would try it out for the, the local uh, shopping channels because David Letterman gave me advice one time, and he said, do whatever you can to stay on the air. If they ask you to be a producer, don't, because you get labeled, you go into a lane, your dream will start to diminish. Now, he doesn't remember who I was, but I remember who he was because he inspired me at the time. I don't know what happened to him the last 10, 15 years, <laughs> but at the time, this guy went after it. So as I did that, I realized more people I talked to were like us. They wanted to be great in something, usually sports is for a lot of guys in my neighborhood anyway. And if you fall short, well, how do you handle that defeat? And if you have success, how did it shape who you were? Because there's certain things you can't control. I can't make that coach start me. I, if you're in a team sport, you can't control the outcome of a game. For the best you can, you're just playing a role. So what do you, how do you deal with that? So I found out that a lot of people learned a lot of life lessons in sports, and I wrote the, the book, The Games Do Count. I interviewed 72 people about what they did in sports and how it shaped them the rest of their life. And I had people like George W. Bush, 43. George Bush, if you saw the, heard the show today, I played the tape. George Bush, 41. Senator John McCain, Robin Williams. I had The Rock. All these people tried to be great and weren't. And when they weren't, they just said, I'm going to double down and going to be success later. I think you can learn more from failing than you can from succeeding. And guess what? You can survive it. People always say, if you, don't, if you don't succeed, you don't win. My glory, and hopefully your glory, was delayed. I know every day I come to Fox, some of you I had a chance to meet. And they say, wow, you do a lot of shows, you work a lot. Because I don't want to blow it. Because I know what it's like between jobs. I know when I got lucky. I walk into a big gym every day. It's like, hey, do you want to play basketball, soccer, football? And you want to play jacks? I go, yeah. If you need me, I'll do it. That's what Fox is. You walk in, it's all hands on deck. If Tucker needs somebody to fill in, if the five needs somebody a little bit taller than Gutfeld, <laughs> I will go in there. And let's be honest, we're all taller than Gutfeld. <laughs> so I do that. And I wrote, it's how you play the game, because I realized even people like Joe Montana and Steve Young, who were successful in sports, by the time you're done at 33, if you don't learn how to be a good teammate, a good person, have good moral codes, you're done, you're finished, you're through. Because that's really what I liked about sports. I never liked, I never loved the final score. I liked the people that played it. And then little by little, as I mentioned, things got more serious. And they gave me the opportunity to do the news. And they gave me the opportunity to do what I do best. Not read the prompter, as you know, but maybe <laughs> to talk about things. So they'll say, Brian, here's one talking point. Uh, you know, uh, Brian, Stephen Ainsley, or all the different uh, female hosts we've had, Edie and Gretchen and Elizabeth. They'll say, I have talking points, and we'll move through them. And a three-hour format is perfect. And when Tony Snow went to the White House, since I was one of his primary fill-ins, they let me fill in for him. I love radio, 
because let's be honest, I can talk. I don't make much sense, but I like and talk. <laughs> so to be able to go from six to nine and nine to set, nine to noon, and to gather a momentum and to be able to go into places like Raleigh, North Carolina, and have people say, I heard, I saw you on TV, I'm gonna listen to you on radio, this is just a remarkable opportunity. So when people say you work a lot, I say, can you keep a secret? I'm not working. Because I'd be the most annoying accountant, the most annoying gym coach, because I'd be talking about the news, and I'd be talking about Trump, and I'd be talking about Obama, and I'd be talking about the, uh, the Mueller report, which, by the way, can you lengthen this whole study a little longer? I don't think it's long <laughs> enough. So the other passion I have is for the country. And the one thing about Fox News, people say, oh, you're to the right, to your left, this guy's more moderate, this person's more conservative. All we are, we get up every day, the one consistency is, we know we live in the best country ever created, and by being born here, or be becoming here, we hit lotto. <laughs> and I think I get a perspective on that because of the household I grew up in, uh, because of the people around me, and because of instinct. If you just look at American history, and you see how unlikely we were to be even created, let alone to survive, let alone survive, let alone thrive, let alone becoming the number one economic and military power in the world, you say to yourself, there's got to be somebody pulling the strings for this nation. We're not perfect. We make mistakes, but we admit them. We get better. We grow faster and harder. And people get upset from the outside, and they say, man, America's coming apart. Do you see the argument? you see the investigations? No. We have different points of view, but we're all pointed in the right direction. Make the country better. It just so happens that we have the best ideas how to make the country together, and other people that don't agree with us don't, under, don't, don't understand that yet. <laughs> and what I found that governed me is the more I look back in history, the more fascinating I got. And when a guy named Bill O'Reilly started pumping out history books, I couldn't get enough of it. Even though I knew this stuff, the way Bill wrote, the way he got to the point, and the exciting way he presented it, I said, I love this, Bill, and you're very popular, but I'm sure this is not going to be a huge bestseller because I don't know if America's that into history. Could I have been more wrong? <laughs> bestseller after bestseller after bestseller, and I realized people were buying it that didn't even know them. They cared about the country. They're truck drivers. Uh, they're insurance agents. They have their busy lives, raising families, but if you tell them about their country, you can tell them something that they didn't know, and you can tell them something that's absolutely accurate, they will embrace it. So I said, Bill, I got this one idea I've been working on for 20 years. I go, what is it? It actually happened in your neighborhood on Long Island. Anybody from Long Island here? So a lot of you. And I know, I'm sorry that we're coming down to North Carolina, but the secret's out. This place is great. Uh, and we got way too many people. You know, we're not even, we don't have even room on the sidewalks right now. So I said that George Washington had this spy ring, and without which, without this spy ring, we don't win the revolution. So I tell him about it, and he goes, uh, you got to write this book. I go, well, it's been some written before, and I hooked up with Don Yeager, and Don Yeager said, Brian, let's do a sports book. He was a former editor of Sports Illustrated. And I go, now, I picked up this huge, huge folder, and I go, I've been working on this for 20 years since 1989. I got to get this to be a movie. If National Treasure could be a successful movie with Nicolas Cage as its lead, and I can't, can I tell you a secret? I don't know what he's saying. <laughs> that story was intriguing, it was successful, and guess what? It wasn't true. This story was true, and this is why I can relate to it. Those people on Mount Rushmore, they deserve to be there. They live up to the test. I'm not that great. But America is fueled by so-called average, everyday Americans doing extraordinary things without getting fame or acclaim. And the people on that Mount Rushmore and those people who are presidents, who are represented many times in our pockets, knew it. And if George Washington didn't, didn't have a farmer, didn't have a longshoreman, didn't have a grocery store owner, uh, didn't have a printer, which was really a journalist back then, who was British, who actually turned to our side because he saw how cool we were, and a socialite working for four and a half years in a covert way that even has today's CIA in awe. How do I know that? I actually went into the CIA to make sure I wasn't going to be telling you a story that I wanted to be true that wasn't true. Because if people get behind you and they listen to you and they read you, they got to know if they talk to their neighbor, what they're saying is accurate. So I went into Langley, Virginia, and it took them two weeks to clear me with background checks. And it was worth it. But the only problem was I didn't clear my driver. Mahmoud uh, Muhammad <laughs> was not able, to, not able to get a day of clearing. 
So I had to walk in 95 degree weather from the watchtower through Langley, Virginia, the winding road into the CIA. And then I penetrate into the backdrop and I go deep into there right before the history section. There's a gift shop. And I'm saying, guys, don't blame yourself if traffic isn't heavy today. Nobody's getting in. Who's going to the gift shop of the CIA? So I sit down there, we open up, he opens up the folder and I say, listen, I'm studying the Culper spy ring, George Washington spy ring that saved the American Revolution. What could you tell me about it? And they go, what could you tell me about it? <laughs> I'm like, really? We're playing this? Now I was fully ready for him to say, oh, that's an exaggeration, that's not true. I tell him, I go, and he said, okay, we got it. They open up their folder and go, this is part of our curriculum that we teach the agents. What they learned with invisible ink, writing between the lines with dead drops and cover stories. We actually go out of our way to teach our men and women before they go on a single mission. They have to know this stuff backwards and forwards. These guys learned it in the middle of a war. Why? Because they wanted to form this country. They wanted to fight for freedom. Not even a country yet, an idea for a country. The only problem is when they take it on the world superpower at that time, they wanted to crush us. And what they were able to do in, uh, in outing Benedict Arnold's plan before it happened, stop a counterfeiting ring for happening that would have flood our country and made all our dollars useless and senseless and maybe make our, our army and navy disband because they can't leave their living to not get paid to fight a war. They were in for a year. They were trying to bring us to our knees. And they, the, what, perhaps the best thing that came out of that book for me was we found out that we got the, for the, the naval codes the British naval codes to the French army before the Battle of Yorktown. So they knew exactly the maneuvers they would make before the ultimate clash that would provide the ultimate battle that would deliver us the war. They lived and died without any acclaim. So in 1989, I happen to be sitting at 25A. If you don't know, it's a famous thoroughfare where there's a lot of signs where history took place during the revolution. And I saw a guy with a guide with four other guys. And they're not dressed like workers. They're dressed in jeans and one guy had a blazer on corduroy and he's going like this in the spring and I said sir no offense I thought a machine did that he said no this is going to wash away I'm sure a machine does this is to commemorate 200 years since George Washington came down this road to thank his spies and I said wow they lived and died without any acclaim they told Washington I will do this for you but never tell anyone our identities before or after or during this war and he didn't but he kept their letters and an enterprising local historian named Morton Pennypacker was relentless in finding out who these spies were. And in the 1930s, we think, he put the final piece together. And when it came out between the Depression and the eve of World War II, not many people paid attention, but we found this little thing in the New York Times that said, local historian makes major find. And with that, it came together like a puzzle. The first piece went in and they all just fell into place. And this thing needs to be a movie, which you saw in that series on on uh, A&E was just terrible. It was a soap opera in colonial outfits. And it doesn't, it's not representative of what these people did. And I just think that story of the spy ring, I can relate to more than the story of Washington because he, he's a kind of great that I can't even get my head around. And the more you study, the more you're in awe. So I did this thing, I did stand up for a while and I wasn't uh, too successful or else I wouldn't be talking history with you. <laughs> And they always told me, when you, if you're doing your set and you get a loud laugh and you're not done, get off. You're not going to beat it. You, whatever you do after that very loud laugh, leave on a high. It's never going to match it, so get off. So I'm like, I looked at that thing for 20 years. I had this one hit. It shocked everyone because many people view me as the sports guy. So I was done. But the publisher says, no, we got to go back. You love history. People love to hear history from you. We see the passion in which you relay it. Go back. So I said, well, the one thing that fascinates me in this war on terror, the creation of ISIS, the rise of bin Laden, was anytime someone writes with context about Islamic extremism, they write about what Jefferson did. And Jefferson's assessment of Islamic extremism was first seen in the northern coast of Africa, these four uh, Barbary nations, uh, Estonia, uh, Tunis, Tunisia, you have um, so, uh, Estonia, uh, Morocco, as well as um, of, uh, Tripoli, and Tripoli, of course, is, is now um, Libya. So what they do is our ships would go down without a navy and without an army as our ships were going to deliver uh, goods and have trade to get us out of war debt. These pirate ships would come out using the Koran as their crutch, and they would take our crew hostage. They would demand ransom. 
they would take the ships and take the cargo. How are we supposed to fight this? It's an emergency. We're not even two years old, and we have our first major enemy. So what's Jefferson going to do? He teams with John Adams. They, they have a diplomatic meeting in England, and Adams goes, I'm making some progress with this Libya guy, this Tripoli guy. He's pretty cool. He understands us. He knows we're not the problem. He understands their problems with Europe. And so he goes, can you come over? So Jefferson comes over from France. They were texting at the time. And <laughs> he shows up, and the ambassador gets to the bottom of it. He says, all nations which had not acknowledged the prophet were sinners, whom it is the right and duty of the faithful to plunder and enslave. Christian sailors were plain and simple fair game. Jefferson and Adams look at each other and go, where did that come from? I told you you're not the enemy. They said, basically, if you're not Muslim, you're the enemy. Were they bastardizing the Koran? Were they using it for their extreme terrorist views? Were they doing that to extort? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. But... And by the way, he went on to say, every Muslim who was slain in this warfare was sure to go to paradise. Does that sound familiar? So Adams leaves, and he's rattled. He says, we can't fight these guys unless we want to fight them forever. For Jefferson, not known as a warmonger, he has just the opposite view. He says to Monroe, we ought to begin a naval power if we mean to carry our own commerce. I am of the opinion that John Paul Jones and a half dozen frigates could totally destroy their commerce by constantly cruising and cutting them to shreds. Adams wants no part of it. Jefferson goes on. Weakness provo provokes insult and injury. A condition to punish it often prevents it. Doesn't he have a cool way of writing? I think it's in our interest to punish the first insult because insult unpunished is the parent of many others. Jefferson's instinct is right, but they write the checks because they weren't able to get a coalition together to fight these guys. So when we finally get a president, Washington knows they still have our guys hostage. We're still writing these checks. He knows we can't afford it, but we need the Mediterranean. So what are we going to do? He says, okay, pitch me, guys. Adams hits his pitch. Jefferson hits his pitch. He goes, all right, I'm going to listen to both of you. I'm going to make the payments for now. And for Jefferson, I'm going to build, I'm going to commission six ships. And we're going to get ourselves, uh, we're going to sell six quick, formidable ships. We're going to spread the contracts out through the 13 colonies. And we're going to find a way to fight for our guys and protect them. So when Adams becomes president, the ships are done. Adams goes, I told you I'm not going to use them. France is our major problem. England's my big worry. I'm not worried about these crazy guys. We're not going to convince them. Let's just ignore it. Now, when Jefferson wins after four years, what do you think he does? Stops making the payments. And he knows what they're going to do. They're going to declare war on us. So Jefferson can go, hey, Congress, listen, they want to fight us. That's not my idea. So in the beginning, we get it wrong. We send our ships over. There's no coordination. We've got the wrong admirals. We've got the wrong leaders. But then we begin to tighten it. Then we begin to set up a blockade. And suddenly, the country that declared war on us finds itself a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, I guess, uh, uh, suffocated. But the leaders are fine. The people suffer, just like today. So William Eaton is another extraordinary American who really attracted to me this story. You open the book and you think about Thomas Jefferson, you close the book, you're going to be thinking about Steve Decatur, William Eaton, and William, and William Bainbridge. They lived and died without any fame and acclaim, but people in those days knew how special they were. This guy, William Eaton, was a tough guy, knew a bunch of languages, was able to live with American Indians, was able to go to a great uh, Ivy League school. At the same time, he was a little crazy. <laughs> so they put him as an ambassador to one of those nations, to over to Tunis. And he sat there and he goes, I love these people. They have no idea what America's about. I hate these leaders. We could take them out. So he comes back. He, the, the blockade's still happening. Jefferson's not seeing enough progress. People are getting restless. Does that sound familiar? And when a war's not successful? So William Eaton goes, you know that idea I had two years ago where I go ahead, find the deposed leader of Libya, go through the desert with a bunch of mercenaries and some Marines and, uh, and take over the country? Remember you told me I was crazy? What do you think now? Now, how do you describe William Eaton? By Mad, uh, uh, Wayne, General Wayne Mad Anthony writes this about William Eaton. Eaton is firm in constitution as in resolution, industrious, indefatigable, determined, and persevering. When in danger, he is in his element and never shows to so good advantage as when leading a charge. You don't know William Eaton. I wouldn't have known him if I didn't study this. He wrote a biography before he passed away. Drank too much at the end, like just about everybody. I think we're the only one sober Americans left. It's a, I'm surprised. We were drinking so much in early America. I'm surprised we got anything done. So Jefferson at first goes, you're crazy. Then he goes, go see Gallatin, the Secretary of Treasury. 
So he comes back. He's got a thousand. He's got uh, a thousand gun, a thousand muskets. He's got money, and he's got a handful of marines. They drop him in Egypt. He finds the deposed leader, hires some mercenaries. All they do is go 500 miles through the desert and take the city of Derna outside Benghazi and Tripoli in two and a half hours. That's your marines. That's your country. We did in that time what Spain, what England, what France wouldn't do. The leader's totally flipped out, immediately says, I want peace, take your guys back. Tobias Lear, trying to make his way and raise his profile, cuts an early peace. Madison will have to go back and finish all these countries up uh, off himself. But what does it say? In case you think it's Brian Kilmeade hyping up what we were capable of in 1805, here's Pope Pius VII. And by the way, if, you're, if you had six prior popes named Pius, could he have picked another name? He says this of Stephen Decatur and his men. The American commander with a small force in a short space of time has done more for the cause of Christianity than the most powerful nations of Christendom have done for ages. That's your country. These are stories that need to be told. So again, the world is watching. The world's seeing we are taking action. And sadly, we're still in the same world. If we don't prepare to fight, if we don't show a willingness to fight, we are going to be forced to fight, and it's going to be on the enemy's terms, not ours. So this book did extremely well because it put into context what the war on terror is about. And Jefferson, the man who's synonymous with intellect and freedom, said the only choice we have is to fight to protect it. So it's no warmonger. It's nobody looking for to revisit Revolutionary War glory. In fact, they asked Jefferson to get a militia together. He said, nah, no thanks, I'm not into that. But he knows, he knows uh, Washington had it handled. So that led me to the War of 1812, which I've been fascinated about. So they told us in school, you don't have to fight the War of 1812. That's kind of an unnecessary war. It's kind of a tie. Could have been avoided. It couldn't have been avoided. The British refused to accept that we lost the Revolutionary War. So they went out of their way to not leave the Midwest, radicalize the American Indian tribes, uh, take our sailors and impress them into service for Britain to take on France. France also expected us to take their side because they helped us. So they started harassing our ships and our commerce. So we were under attack. In come the Warhawks through a transformational midterm election. I've heard about a few of them. <laughs> and they vote. 79 to 49 in the House, 1913 in the Senate, the closest vote of any declaration of war, game on. Now, we had every reason to fight the war. We have a lot to win in this war, and we had a lot to lose. The only one thing that we were lacking was an army. <laughs> and the only problem with our opponent is that they were even bigger, stronger, and angrier than before. They were the world's number one naval, and, uh, and, uh, and the number one navy, and the number one cavalry in the world and they were thirsting for this revenge. So the war starts, and they start terrorizing the Atlantic coast. We do a great thing. We take what we have of a series of militias, take our Revolutionary War generals, 29 years after the revolution, and we go fight in Canada. Genius. <laughs> we have a series of setbacks, a few wins, but bottom line is we're totally naked on the East Coast, and they are terrorizing us. Now, how bad are things now? Not bad when you consider we're outgunned, we're outmanned, and the northern part of our country said, hey, we didn't vote for this war, England. So if you just leave us alone, we're not going to fight. We're not going to send guys. This is pretty much the South's problem. They have a Hartford Convention where they agree that they're going to go to Madison and say, we're pretty much going to do our own thing. You guys fought this war. Jefferson had this embargo that destroyed our commerce. We don't think it's necessary. I always got along with England. We're going to just stay out of this. Then in comes Andrew Jackson. And the turning point was the British pushed it too far. When they decide to take Washington, take Baltimore, and then take Washington and burn it to the ground, and if it wasn't for a undescribed uh, hurricane tornado that whips through and forces the British out before they can burn absolutely everything, our whole country could have been destroyed right there. So for people who think, well, wow, President Trump's tweets are a little brusque, and Barack Obama's passive attitude allowed ISIS to, to rise up, we're in trouble. Think about the big picture. This is trouble. So Jackson, who put his hand up early, said, I want to fight this war. They wiped out my family by 14 years old. 
My brother died of heat stroke in the Revolutionary War. Me and my brother were taken captive in the Revolutionary War. My brother never recovered from the head injuries he uh, suffered on the capture. My mom died when it was just me and her, and she had to go earn a living, and I'm alone. I know two things. My country, my county raised me, and I will bleed red, white, and blue. And if I'm Andrew Jackson, I live to pay back the British for what it did to him. And instead of becoming a vagrant or a criminal, even in America without food stamps or social programs, although they did have Medicaid. Uh, <laughs> Medicaid for all. I think it works. It's very effective. <laughs> he was able to become a lawyer, a judge, an attorney general, a congressman, a senator, and most importantly, a militia general. So I want to move this forward and let you see that what hasn't been seen since it aired on Fox News. This is Andrew Jackson and the miracle of New Orleans. Let's watch. 29 years after defeating the British and winning our independence, America was on the brink of annihilation in the War of 1812. The British were terrorizing the East Coast, had burned Washington, D.C. to the ground. They were heading down south to finish us off. Perilous times. Here at the Hermitage, Major General Andrew Jackson was seething. He had offered his services and his militia to go into battle to fight the British in the War of 1812, but never got the return call. And his country was losing this war badly. Would he get the call? Yes. Would he offer revenge on the British? Absolutely. America needed a leader. They looked to Jackson. Jackson enters the war, and things turn. A series of small victories all led to the final clash in New Orleans. The historic French Quarter. Charters in St. Louis. Why would I bring you to this intersection? Because it was right here in this building, 200 plus years ago, where Andrew Jackson met with his generals and they sketched out a battle plan to take on the British, it was nothing short of brilliant and yielded unparalleled success. The plan, build a wall, dig a canal, fill it with water and wait, wait for the British to charge. The British walked right into the trap and were defeated January 8th, 1815 in under 45 minutes. If you lost New Orleans, and if the British control the great city, you lose the entire Mississippi River, and you lose all of our western frontier that we acquired through the purchase, so we wouldn't have been able to do westward expansion. The War of 1812 allowed Jackson to earn a new title, war hero, catapulting him to the presidency for two terms. The boy, orphaned by 13, ended up as one of the most powerful men in American history. But he was also one of the most controversial. Nobody doubts that Andrew Jackson was an impactful president, but now his legacy is being re-examined today. Why? Because of the people that lived in quarters like that. Those are slave quarters. And at one point, Jackson had over 100 slaves working the Hermitage property. And he had many famous battles with American Indians, as well as playing a role in the Indian Removal Act. With all those things aside, it hasn't stopped 14 presidents, some of the best we've ever had, from coming to this place to find out what made Andrew Jackson, Andrew Jackson. Lincoln saw how Jackson kept our country together after South Carolina tried to secede during his administration. Teddy Roosevelt wrote a book on Jackson and studied his leadership principles. In Harry Truman, Andrew Jackson had perhaps his greatest admirer. Harry Truman, for example, kept a figurine on his desk of Jackson. That's correct, and, and actually came here to measure Jackson's clothes so that the statues he commissioned for Kansas City and uh, Independence were proportioned to Jackson. And then Ronald Reagan came here to wait a second to salute the founder of the Democratic Party. Yep, Ronald Reagan came here to speak. He spoke very vehemently about Jackson and the ideals of Jackson that needed to be brought back into the country in the, in the 1980s. And when Donald Trump came here, he was the third president to lay a wreath down on Jackson's tomb. Andrew Jackson was a military hero and genius and a beloved president. Andrew Jackson. The Battle of New Orleans made him famous. The way he led made him iconic. The way he lived made him infamous, and most degree for America, indispensable. So that's Andrew Jackson, that's what he did. Listen to these stats. It was 8,500 against his 5,300 troops. We lost 13 guys, 13. They lost 291. We had, 30, uh, we had a 39 wounded, they had 1,262. They had 484 missing people blown to smithereens. But what Jackson also did is aim for their officers, Three generals, seven colonels, 75 officers dead. 
The British followed orders. When they didn't have a superior officer, they didn't know what the heck to do. Jackson took advantage of it. In fact, when they went to surrender, this guy Lambert, Lieutenant Lambert, comes up and says, I'd like to surrender. Uh, we were out of guys. And Jackson said, keep going back. He didn't believe him. He says, send me your superior officer. He said, General, you killed them all. <laughs> so people come back, and they told us in school, we didn't really have to fight that battle. The Treaty of Ghent was signed. Communication was just slow. It was a big win, and, and there's a lot of reason to be proud if you're the 3rd Infantry, the 3rd Infantry, 2nd Division, or 1st Division. That's who fought the cotton ballers, used cotton to build the wall, and would solidify. But there's a different story. It's called the truth. Jackson knew what the deal was. And eight years ago, Ron Drez, a decorated Marine turned uh, elite historian, found paperwork in Britain that showed General Packingham, who was in charge of the British troops, said, if you get New Orleans, when you get New Orleans, ignore all talk of a treaty. You stay. We don't grow past the Mississippi. We stop. It's not Douglas Brinkley's opinion. That was the plan. Now, with all the success they had, why wouldn't they have been successful? And why do you think the British wouldn't have stayed? They only left Hong Kong five minutes ago. They had India for extra 100 years. They're still in the islands harassing us on vacation, <laughs> trying to convince us to eat anything they make, which isn't good. When's the last time you said, well, that's, that, that tastes like British. It's great. <laughs> so here's what Jackson said. If General Packingham and his 10,000 matchless veterans could have annihilated my little army, he would have captured New Orleans, sentried the contiguous territory. Through technicality, the war was over. Great Britain would have immediately abrogated the Treaty of Ghent and would have ignored Jefferson's transaction with Napoleon. They had an international case that the Louisiana Purchase was an illegal flip by Napoleon. I had no idea of this. Did you guys? No idea that there was a press around the world that Napoleon got it, was running out of money, and just sold it to us. We sent James Monroe over there to get New Orleans. We basically doubled the size of the country for virtual pennies. Jefferson, kind of an enemy and a bit of an antagonist for, of uh, Jackson, said this. The defense of New Orleans should teach the nations of Europe that while Americans intended to take no part in their wars, neither would the country shrink from self-defense. This is our her heritage. So many times we should have been destroyed. We certainly shouldn't look like the country we were looking at. And somehow, some way, we prevail. When Jackson left office, he wasn't perfect, but man, he was impressive. He was more powerful, I would argue, and the power base at the Hermitage, when all future politicians would come for his advice, when he was done, as he was when he was in office. Here's what he said in his farewell address. I thank God for my life that has been spent in a land of liberty that he has given me a heart to love my country with the affection of a son, a son to his country, and a father to his people. He knew he hit Lotto, even though life dealt him a pretty tough hand. And here's what brings us up today. Stephen Douglas was asked to give closing remarks to unveil the statue that we now see in Washington that Ronald Reagan insisted on taking his picture with for the cover of Newsweek magazine. Said this, when Jackson had died, there was a sense of completion that the race had been finished. He felt his work was done, his mission fulfilled. All felt that a great man had fallen, yet there was a consolation in the consciousness to the luster of his name, the fame of his great deeds, and the results of his patriotic services would be preserved through all time, a rich inheritance to the devotees of freedom. But what has happened over the last few years? For the first time, including from when he, the country was founded and when he died and when he was buried at the Hermitage, that includes prior to the Civil War, his grave was defiled. There's a group in New Orleans who live and breathe every day to find a way to take a statue down out of New Orleans. And they were trying to take him off to 20. Donald Trump kind of put a stop to that or a pause. So that's what I think we're in danger of. And that's why I want to double down and talk about history with people that care, like you guys. Because for some reason, our history, which we know we're not perfect, but I think what's great about America is we're trying to be. And we go back in time, and we don't say Jackson's perfect, Columbus is fantastic, uh, General Washington had no weaknesses. We know they all had weaknesses. Who could ever justify slavery? It's unthinkable that the smartest men on the planet could somehow justify it, even though on some level I think they all knew it was wrong. I'll never justify that. But there's a lot of things we're doing now that generations in the future will laugh at and say, what were those people in 2018 thinking? I never thought history should be looked at like that. I think you should study it, not judge it. And that's my hope. 
that I'm going to introduce to you uh, different stories along the way. I'm going to go out of my way to make sure they're accurate. If you see on the back of the book, there's Jay Winnick, Douglas Brinkley, John Meacham, uh, and others that look at it and make sure, uh, General Stanley McChrystal, that this lives up to the, what had actually happened at that time. I am not interested in writing for the Harvard professor. These professors write for themselves anyway, not to be read. I'm interested in the so-called average everyday American who is so very busy, will have to pick up and put down that book whenever they have a chance, whenever the kids aren't crying, or you're not running to a game, or you have to go work overtime or go to an event. That's in my mind. When you have a moment, you'll choose to read it, and you should know that nobody's more passionate in writing it. So with that, that's my mayor presentation. Do you want to know what I'm working on now? Yes. Thank goodness you said yes. If not, I probably would have stopped. <laughs> uh, sorry, guys, no market for it. Uh, Sam Houston avenging the Alamo. Yes. And, and it's, the Alamo wasn't a, a great result, but man, it was a great motivation. And Sam Houston was fought with Jackson. He was mentored by Jackson. And the linkage is almost as if I could close one book and open up another. I never realized how much Texas history is American history. I always thought, man, they have such pride in Texas. I'll leave that to them. But the more you see the character that they have, and they were able to transfer to us that it was two-thirds uh, Americans anyway in uh, Texas at the time. And you could make an argument that the Louisiana Purchase included Texas to begin with. And that Jackson was so mad at John Quincy Adams for saying, hey, uh, Mexico, you could keep uh, Texas. We're just going to take Florida. Jackson says, I already won Florida. We don't need anyone's permission. <laughs> so it's a fascinating look at what's next. But what I like to say to you is, number one, thank you for listening. Number two, I also want to be signing everybody's book after this. And we'll take a picture over there, I believe over there. And number three is, I want to open it up for questions. So if you have a few questions and you promise to be well behaved, which I think is a very well behaved crowd, I'd give you all uh, shining stars if I had them. <laughs> we could ask some questions, move it along. It doesn't just have to be about history, it could be what's going on right now. I mean, there's a blizzard of information coming here. Uh, between what's going on with Michael Cohen, between uh, Paul Manafort, uh, James Comey's meeting. By the way, I can't get enough of him. I find him fascinating. <laughs> uh, I can't wait to go somewhere and go, hey, do you hear about James Comey? And someone say, who? I go, good. <laughs> so that's my time. I hope you're listeners. Now I want you to be pretend you're callers, and we can open the phones. By a show of hands, who's not really shy and has a lot to say? I know it's a lot of you because you've been drinking. I've been watching. Question? If you stand up, just give us your name. Okay. Hi, I'm Beverly. Hi, Beverly. Like everyone here, I'm a big fan. Thank you so much. So I have a, um, a silly question, and then if I can be like the Washington Press pool, I'll have a follow-up. Okay, so my silly one is, on Fox & Friends, Brian, I noticed that whenever there's a food segment that you take a pass... Um, participating. Right. And, and I. Couple of things, that, couple okay. of reasons. Number one, back off. I'm tired of your judgment. I'm only, I'm only kidding. <laughs> no, I. My feeling is this. When you're on the air, there's nothing more disgusting than watching someone chew their food into a microphone. I, I picture you at home going, hey, easy. You know? You, you, most of you aren't dressed, let's be honest. And you're watching, you're doing many things, like, why is he eating? Number two, how can I talk and eat? And number three, a lot of the stuff uh, isn't that good. <laughs> a lot of it's meat. I don't really eat meat. I eat chicken, but I don't eat meat. I'd rather not have fried. Um, I did eat today because I forgot to have breakfast. So I literally said to myself, I'm going to eat. I had some of that um, uh, smash cake. What was that? Yeah, three milk cake. By the way, we had one of the cans was evaporated milk. Why wasn't it empty? Uh, thank you, Beverly. Oh, wait, your follow up. Yeah, I have follow up. So my serious question is, you, along with most all of your Fox News colleagues, get a, a lot of criticism. Right. And I'm just wondering how you personally deal with that. I cry. <laughs> and I am not afraid to cry. Uh, no, you know, the thing is, it's, a, it's an extraordinary time. I mean, it's not just us. Look at Kevin Hart. I mean, who would think that Kevin Hart, who's a conglomerate unto himself in the middle of Hollywood, makes all these movies with all these liberal co-stars, Will Farrell knocking on doors for Stacey Abrams and all this stuff. Those are, the, those are his buddies. And he can't, he can't host the Oscars because of a tweet in 2011. 
So if you wonder why, number one, if you wonder why I do all these shows and try to take no day for granted, it's not rhetoric. It's true. You never know if you're going to say something, uh, especially because I really have no script most of the time. Uh, you never say something that could destroy yourself. It wouldn't be intentional, but you never know. Uh, but the criticism's coming fast and furious, but it's a small price to pay to be able to be invited and wanted to be heard at Raleigh, North Carolina. If I didn't have this great job, even though I'm really cute, you wouldn't have come. <laughs> so that's the flip side of it. Yes. What's your favorite uh, series uh, that you, you have on that show and, and why? Okay, Fox Nation, I've been doing it for about a year. I've had 10 features. Uh, they said, what made America great? As you see, I love the topic. So it's an app. And they think eventually, I'm fascinated by what's happening in television now. First it was like, everything's going to be cable. Cable never work. Cable's in, now cable's passe. We're not ready to get rid of it yet, but you got to be ready to move. There's a sense that we're going to be looking at our phones and our TVs. Like, for example, if you stay at the Marriott, they ask you about internet TV. You're not really going to know the difference between your local, your local um, Fox affiliate and FBN, Fox Business Network. You know, I might not know the difference. Hey, you know what? I'm going to click on Fox News. Oh, uh, Kill Me's not on. I'm going to flip the channel. No more kidding. No, and then you're going, to, you're going to click on FBN and watch Lou Dobbs. It's going to be a click. And then they want to be ready with more programming because the sense is, that uh, Fox doesn't have viewers, they have fans. So let's give them more, but let's not take advantage of them. Let's create brand new programming. Anything you see on Fox Nation, is you're not gonna see on the channel. You might see a little tease, that's it. So what they asked me to do is pick out 10 places, they gave me great producers, and I went to Mount Rushmore, went to the Vice President's residence, went to Monticello, went to the Hermitage, went to a place called Fort Jefferson in the middle of the Keys, recreated the Aaron Burr, uh, Alexander Hamilton duel. We actually shot each other, I was mortally wounded. And uh, you know, we started right in Manhattan. Um, uh, Francis Tavern, where George Washington said goodbye to his spies in 17, and uh, not said goodbye to all his officers in 1784, the oldest restaurant in Manhattan. He actually brought these people to the very floor in the very same setup and said goodbye, and then walked out to a barge, down to another barge, down to Mount Vernon, and he thought he was done with the country. So I'm able to take these 10 things, and they said something I never heard before in my life in television, Take as long as you want to tell the story. So I got 40 minutes, 25 minutes, 50 minutes to tell the story. And I try to bring some new twist. And Ryan Zinke, who's awesome, a Navy SEAL and a Secretary of the Interior, and he's a real man, I'm not. And he brings me up the side of the Mount, Ru Ru Mount Rushmore Mountain. We go through there that only the state troopers get to go and the federal officials. We go behind the heads and into the Hall of Records. It was originally built to house our original documents the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence. I think they put that in one of the national treasures, but it's actually true, it sat, sit there. The problem is the creator of Mount Rushmore never got permission from the government, and he was already over budget, and over, it took 14 years instead of five. So they said, uh, what are you doing? Stop. So it's half done. And then Ryan Zinke said, you see those stairs? Do you want to walk up? I go, yeah. So we walk up the stairs, and we keep going, I end up on George Washington's head looking down on Jefferson, Lincoln, and Teddy Roosevelt. So you'll see that, uh, and you'll just be able to say, well, maybe I can't get to South Dakota, but you'll have a new view of it. And as you see, I'm passionate about it, and I haven't seen anyone click on it and said that was a waste. So far, 85% of the people that took the trial uh, took the app. It's $5 a month, and if you're on a tight budget, I get it, uh, $60 a year. But I just know that we got some of the best people working on it, and there's also live programming. And we have that show that you hear on WPTF, they stream it live. So you'll get to see uh, what I'm wearing on radio, which oftentimes, no shirt. <laughs> uh, and you'll probably proof for $5 a month, you can tell your neighbors. Yes. Hey, Brian, thank you very much for Cheers. being here. 2018 has been a fascinating year. What predictions do you have for 2019? Wow, okay, a couple of things. I want them to get something done. I am so, I, I, don't, I don't mind. But keep in mind, for those of you who are clapping and you're conservative, that might mean compromise. You might, I want, this is what I want to do on our show today. Uh, they did criminal justice reform, they did immigration reform, uh, they, fixed, uh, they came up and fixed Obamacare, made it Trump care, whatever. I want to debate who got the better deal, rather than debate who benefited politically from the lack of a deal? 
I am so sick of it. Well, the Republicans got to pay the price at the ballot. Well, Democrats are going to be responsible for the shutdown. Well, Republicans are going to be, if they don't build a wall, it's going to get the electorate motivated to go vote. I am so done with that argument. There is no reasonable reason not to build a wall. None. And except for, there are areas, you don't need a wall. We all know it. If you've been down there, there's areas you don't need a wall. The, the mountains are there, it's impossible. You need the virtual wall. You need monitoring. I leave it to the Border Patrol. They're apolitical. You talk to those men and women, they're working so hard, they just don't want to be ignored. They don't care who's president. They just want some backup. And for those people who think the president did that for electoral purposes, I don't know if you heard, except for in North Carolina, the midterms are over. <laughs> yeah, I was in Florida, and I thought they, they were uh, screwed up the election, but you guys are determined to beat them. <laughs> so, so, um, so I think that this whole thing with the caravan and what's going on at the border and putting the troops there, the troops aren't there for show. They've got to stay through Christmas, sadly, but it shows how necessary they are. They're actually putting up the razor wire and building their own walls because these idiots in Washington can't get together on anything. So I think you also have to be ready not to get everything you want. I'm okay with not getting everything I want because the way our system was set up, we're not supposed to. What happens is, if you make your ideas better and you communicate them better, what happens is, at the ballot box, you'll end up with over 60 senators and the majority in the House, and then guess what? You'll get everything you want, and virtually everything you want, but there's always a moderates and a Susan Collins and a Joe Manchin on the other side. They'll say, yeah, that's it's gonna be a problem. But that's just the way we're set up. I predict, number one, this Mueller thing's gotta wrap up, I think, before the new Congress takes over. I predict that uh, Democrats will overstep in their investigations. And they don't understand. There's a part of Donald Trump who actually wants to fight every day. To a part, it's like Mike Tyson when he was 19, you know? <laughs> so there's a part of him where, like, you and I would be so stressed by this, we'd have to say to ourselves, why do I need it? There's a part of him who wants that edge. I don't know if you heard, but he's on Twitter now. <laughs> And I think he hit 12 tweets before I walked up here today. So that's, that's what I predict. And I just hope that something's going to surprise us. I just hope it doesn't come from ISIS, who is starting to rumble that they're trying to do something in New York City. Uh, we can never take our eye off the ball there. And I love the fact that we reassert ourselves in Iraq. That government now wants us there. They no longer take us for granted. I think Iran has overplayed their hand big time. And I see things getting marginally better. The one good thing is, I think Israel is no longer isolated like it was. There's a lot of Middle East nations that are working with Israel in a way many, many people didn't think possible. So I think, I think that's heartening. I also take heart in this. I don't like, when you put down a president, whether it's Obama, Clinton, Bush, or Trump, you put down us. And what the French have done with this Macron in his tight suits and his older wife, Kind of just smugly putting up with Trump and tolerating Trump. I think I how to play Trump. Well, congratulations. You and your 26% approval rating have upped the, upped the taxes so high in your country who only wants to work three and a half days a week that there's wild protests in the street. You have relinquished, backed off because green energy is great. When you can fly like a private jet like Bernie Sanders or Al Gore and show up at a, at a green rally, but when the average person who's barely making ends meet finds out that gas is over $7 a liter or a gallon, whatever measurement they're using, and it affects their life, they're going to go on the internet, they're going to rally, and they're going to send a message. Congratulations. You put down Trump, he's got 46% approval rating. You got 22. And when the riots happen, you went on vacation this weekend. So and there's a reason why this Brazilian leader just won. There's a reason why Australia just rotated through. There's a reason why Merkel's on her farewell tour, and Theresa May has never had looked more comfortable dancing than she has recently in presenting Brexit. <laughs> All their ideas and their lofty ideas and those professional politicians are falling on their face. So before you're critical of Trump and say he's naive and doesn't understand the position, what are you doing? Brian? Yeah. Yeah. Brian? Um. Oh. Just hold one second. Yeah. Just two things real quick. Um, my husband's a Texan. <laughs> wow. And uh, I, he's a military, and he's away at training, and he couldn't be here tonight. And I texted him about the subject of your next book, 
and he is jumping for is joy. He in? Yeah, right, he good. says, "Sweet." All right. Um, my question is, um, of of all the normal, regular contributors that you have on Fox and Friends, uh, Krauthammer, uh, John Noble, uh, Gene Simmons, uh, any of the folks that you, you Geraldo, that you have, uh, who gets you the most excited to come in in the morning that you know is going to show up? Hmm. I know we're taping this. I don't want to insult anyone. Uh, <laughs> Couple of guys, I love that we just signed Jonathan Turley again. I think it's fantastic. Newt Gingrich never does not produce and say something interesting. I think Griff Jenkins has been awesome out in the field and he's great in studio too. He was, uh, he was mentored by Tony Snow and this guy named Oliver North uh, and he is just great. In terms of uh, high profile producers, Judge Napolitano has never had a bad appearance. Even if you don't agree with him, man, can he communicate? Uh, we did a really good job hiring Jason Chaffetz. I hope we get Trey Gowdy. So I would, I would think. Um, I know I'm leaving. Uh, I know I'm leaving someone out. Uh, well, the ones I don't like to are done, sit next to Steve. So I know that. No, I'm, uh, no, I have no say in that. Um, that's a good question. I'm trying to think because a lot of them we drag up on the radio after. That's one of the great things about being on Fox News. It's like being in a mall. You sit there on the surveillance camera and you go, okay, they're on radio, they're on television, bring them in after, we book them, other people take them. So we really have breaking news. We have breaking news and we could uh, have Allison who's here, uh, we'll text Catherine Herridge in the field, she'll do a TV hit, pick up the phone and call in. I really feel good about what the listeners are getting. You don't need my opinion every second of the day, you need information. So I want to get your information and slide an opinion. Give you the latest and give my opinion in. If I have a guest that's smarter than me, and there aren't many, <laughs> I, I'm going to let you hear them. And if they don't agree, I, I'll bring Marie Harf in, and we don't agree on a lot, but I want you to hear. Okay. <laughs> I, hate, I can't believe Mrs. Harf is here today. Her mom is upset that. No, she, she's, very, she's a, a wonderful person, very nice, and gives you another perspective. I don't think we need to sing out of the same hymn book. The one thing about Fox is you don't have to flip the channel to get another opinion. It doesn't do you any good just to hear people that just agree with you. You need to be tested and expanded. So, especially now, you know, uh, there's a lot of things coming out. The Republicans, conservatives, this, this crime reform, there's a lot of very conservative people who think it's because criminal justice reform is great, and there's Tom Cotton who swears it's bad. It doesn't do you any good to only tell you one side of that story. So, I'm going to forget a bunch of contributors uh, right off. The, here's the underrated guy that I hope to see a lot more from. Number one, did you see Daniel Krauthammer this week? Oh, yeah. How great is he? Number two, he doesn't speak loudly, but man, he says a lot. Victor Davis Hanson. Yeah. Tucker has him on, Laura has him on. He's really good from a Hoover Institute, and his books are fantastic. He's a genius, and I just think that he tends to be able to analyze situations the closest to Charles Krauthammer immediately and make them simple to understand. And you think to yourself, why didn't I think of that? So, Yes. Uh, all this talk about Andrew Jackson is great, but when are you going to tell us about you and your wife's cookbook? Uh, you mean Steve Ducey's cookbook? No, you mean Steve Ducey's cookbook? Yeah. Um, Uh, please buy it because he's broke, right? <laughs> he has no money. No, his book has done exceedingly well, and maybe because he put Sean Hannity's book, Recipe, on page 142. Hannity can't take that. I don't know if you heard, he used to be a number one in everything, and it's justified. Uh, but I, I donated my mom's meatballs, and my mom's meatballs are legendary, and what happened is, uh, wherever you go, everyone would ask for my mom's meatballs, and then in college, I was able, my mom, I was able to pay for everything, between sports, academics, and uh, financial aid. I was all done. She says, I'm gonna make the food. I was only 45 miles away from home, so every other week I'd get food. And she would actually make these meatballs. People actually would stand outside my door. I wouldn't tell her, I never got to eat them. People were like, can I have them? So when I showed them to Steve, that's in the book. If you try them, I had people at my last appearance say they made them, and they're fantastic, so I'm a little biased. But you should try my mom's meatballs. They came from her mom, and her mom goes back to Italy. I don't know if you heard, but the Italians can certainly cook. <laughs> hey, yes. Brian, how you doing? My name is Tom. 
Uh, just a quick uh, current events question about the information that uh, Mueller uh, put out tonight about Michael Cohen and uh, Paul Manafort. There, uh, some news outlets are saying that Trump has committed a felony, and this is it. This is he's down for the count. Uh, well, uh, what do you, what do you, what is the, the of feeling things. about this? Number one, if uh, I got through the the Cohen stuff, but not the Cohen related Russia stuff. This is, and I, the Paul Manafort was here, I decided to come into the cocktail hour and sign some books, so I didn't get the latest. But let me tell you what I know. Cohen's not getting off easy. You have to see every plea that he had underneath that document, it was 42 pages, 37 pages, they said why he's absolutely not getting leniency. Because he lied, he defrauded, he knew better, he lied to banks, he lied to everyone. So most of his criminal charges, and most of the things he did, he basically did on his own. He went from making 80000 to 500000 with uh, President Trump. And I just don't understand, if they don't believe in the Southern District of New York, and they didn't believe him, uh, he's admitted he lied to Congress, why do they believe him now? So that's one credibility issue. Uh, the Paul Manafort stuff, I'm not sure. They're talking about contacts with Russia. All I know is, fundamentally, Donald Trump wasn't sure he was going to win. There's no question. He was signing leases and inspections for elevators in buildings around the world while he was on Air Force One. And they said, you know, uh, Mr. Trump, what are you doing? Before he's going to rally, he was still running his business. So if you came up to him and said, I got a Moscow project, he's probably, all right, I got a, I got a Scottish golf course. All right, tell me how it's going to work. I have a, a hotel in um, Qatar. He's got a hotel in Qatar. He's got properties around the world international deals. Now, with all those deals, I was talking to one of the family members this week. Do you know how many pitches we get on a daily basis that don't ever pan out? So since 1987, he's been interested in building in the Soviet Union that turned into Russia. In 1997, he began. In 1996, he tried again. In 2003, he tried. In 2015, he said, this Moscow project, why don't I do this? Well, the only way to do business in Russia is to go to the Kremlin. The, uh, this guy was signing off on everything. So Cohen was doing this, making contacts. To me, the mistake that I've seen so far is if you're doing a project in, in Russia and there's nothing wrong with it, just say, yeah, I got a Moscow project. I stopped doing it in January. I got people working for me all the time. I'm still taking pitches in about doing something in Saudi Arabia. Ultimately, for example, they, would, they, they walked away from doing a Saudi Arabian deal because they said women couldn't be on certain floors and all these things. I, I can't put the Trump name with all how you view men and women. So I'm pulling out there. Carter was able to they would do whatever he wants. He has a hotel there. He was going to have problems. Any businessman is going to have problems. You bring, he, let's say he's easy on Cutter for whatever reason. Well, it's because your hotel's there. Well, what are you supposed to do? Take his name off it? His, his sons are running the company. Well, let's say he's pro breaking up the British Empire. Well, it's because you have a, uh, you have a, you have a golf course in Scotland and you just want to do that for Scotland. You can make an argument like that. So from what I saw, he could have been more candid and said that Mike Cohen was speaking up until June, but after that, there was nothing. Fundamentally, Jonathan Turley seemed to sum it up right, is that uh, he sees that they're putting together a circumstantial case, and they want you th to see this and then decide what you want to do with it. But I don't think there's anything there that, uh, as Trump said, he's 100% innocent. Jonathan Turley was breaking it down, saying some disturbing things, but there's some things that make them look good. I would just say this. If you could tell me that Facebook ads into Chicago and Dallas turned this election, you weren't paying attention. So. Unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, we have to bring the evening to a close. Give Brian a big, big hand. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. it.